Good afternoon. I'm here with uh, my two guests, uh, poet to poet, for poet to poet, writer to writer, Greg Wallace, and um, and Michael C. Keith. Um, just before I let you know, um, um, you know, I'm, I haven't let people, I haven't let people know on poet to poet, writer to writer that I'm now the co-president of the New England Poetry Club with uh, Denise Prof. Provost, and we have a lot of great programming, and you might want to go to NEPC.org um, to find out about our, our membership and the services that we offer. Um, uh, thank you for that. Um, anyway, uh, we have uh, Mike Keith. He's the author of a new collection of uh, flash fiction called Quiet Geography, and he's taught at, uh, he's, he's taught at Boston, Boston College for many years. And, the, and is the author of many publications, including uh, his novel, um, Next uh, Memoir. Oh, memoir. Memoir. Next Better Place, Al Gonzalez. Yeah, yeah, which I've taught for several years at Endicott yeah, College. Yeah, you had me as a guest. Yeah, I had you as a guest. And we have Greg Wallace, who has two new books out, a novel, Kika Kong, and short story, um, Green Ray and Other Stories. Um, his writing has been noted for his mixture of uh, weirdness and humor. Um, and, and in fact, I could say that about both of you gentlemen. Um, what, that the, we're weird? We, we, no, I mean, your writing is. But um, <laughs> you, you weird, but you have an ample dose of kind of humor. Maybe you can address that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think you're right. I mean, it, it seems to pop up in about everything I write, even though some, some of these things can be very dark. But it's just. Uh, you know, it can't be denied. It's in my nature, and then it flows from my pen. And it's, it throws from your past. And that, too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, uh, my time on the road with my father was uh, completely uh, uh, informed by the absurd irony of living the way we did. And we, despite the fact that our lives were very tough, uh, we, we mitigated that by laughter. So yeah, so it's. Uh, I think that's what gallows it, humor. That good phrase, yeah, good, yeah, absolutely. That's what it was, you know. So I think a lot of gallows humor probably is apparent in in the things that uh, that I write. And you? Yeah, I, I I feel kind of the same way as as Mike does. It leaks out of a past with having brothers who found everything my parents said absurdly funny. Um, uh, mm, and a lot of my kind of humor derives, I think, from Kafka, who's a, 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 on virtually everything I write, I append the Ka Kafka message. Uh, a literary work should be an ice axe to break up the frozen sea inside us. Now, that doesn't sound funny. And it may not sound funny to have like the, the eventual slush around in your head, but I usually find it funny in some way. OK. Um. Now, um, in your book, Greenway and Other Stories, Greg, um, you have bees as the, pro uh, not the protagonist, the antagonist, but maybe in a way protagonist, too. Um, and you, you keep the reader engaged, and, um, and you subvert his or her expectations that the baby in this thing would be the victim mm -hmm. of... of um, the coyote in yeah. the end, not to give away too much. But well, that's yeah, a, that, that that's sort of does it, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm sorry. You have to buy it now. Right, right, right. Well, the first half of that story is actually almost word for word true. Uh, there were bees trapped in the wall of my house the day we were going to have the final observation of it before we sold it. Uh, and I had to slaughter them to the real sadness of some of my friends who are real bee advocates. Uh -huh. um, but uh, the, uh, the end of the story obviously isn't. Uh, right? it, it's funny that that particular story was, a, was, was uh, initially published with a, a, a journal that dealt with nature and, the, and, and really that's what the story is ultimately about, that nature, nature comes to play here. I mean, it's, uh, the dog, little, little Iota, kind of sacrifices herself uh, accidentally, we would say, but uh, the coyotes are always out there. They'll go for they'll go for what uh, whatever they can find. But the sense I get of you two gentlemen, a lot of your, um, I mean, a, a lot, you you are, you are both picking through the ice 
um, so to speak, as you said, to the Kafka was. I mean, you have these, a lot of them are uh, suburban backgrounds, people planning everything, everything, you know, that's trying to control the innate chaos of the world. Um, and, um, you know, uh, and so I think you share that sensibility. I, I, yeah. I, yeah. Uh, I think uh, my attention is toward the uh, uh, kind of abs absurdity of, of effort, the absurdity of life. Uh, it's not that it's hopeless, but, you know, we live in a situation where I think uh, uh, we don't know. We, we really don't know where we're going. We don't know where we've been even. It's, it's inexplicable. Uh, my view of the world is that, it, that there's just no definitive thing to hang our hat on. And, and I think, uh, you know. Uh, there is no there, there. <laughs> there's no there. Yeah, well, apropos of that, I, I think we make up mysteries for ourselves. And I think that's where the Green Ray concept for me comes out, the little preface in there that states where it comes from, um, the Jules, Jules Verne novel of the same name. And what is the green ray? It's uh, as the sun sets, if, it's a perf if the environment is perfect for it, if the sun sets, there's just as it disappears, a momentary green, green, uh, green flash yeah, that it's known as. And purportedly, according to Jules Verne and others, if you see that flash, and you're with somebody else, not only do you see deeply into yourself, but you can see into the heart of, and so, spirit of whoever is with you. So there's a sort of universality, but it's, it's a fiction. It's completely made up that that, uh, that, that sort of thing exists. And in these stories, anyway, that's what's happening to the characters. They're looking for something, as you said before, to anchor on in life. And, and they produce their own kind of mystery to explain it. Mm. Is that satisfactory? Depends on the story and the situation. But uh, I guess that's what we grow out of, as you say, with our, a lot of the characters are suburban characters that mm -hmm. resemble us. Um, now, Mike, in, the, in, 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 in these uh, sort of miniature and minimalist flash <coughs> fiction pieces, you, you develop layers of meaning. Um, and you know, they're sort of like uh, they're sort of like jokes with a punchline, but it's not a simple punchline. I mean, but you know, um, yeah. Um, I try to. I, I go to it feeling I have a, uni a universe here. I don't see them as fragments, really, and and a lot of times they just spill out, and how they spill out is. How, how they end up on, on the page. But always there's uh, a sense of, of trying to tell something about the properties of existence. Experience. But uh, you know, I think Freud said that jokes are a form of aggression. Do you feel that you have any sort of aggression to get out in your, in your work? Yeah, I'm very aggressive. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, you've seen some of my titles. Let us now speak of extinction. Mm -hmm. Who the heck wants to speak of extinction? You know, but when people did read the book, they uh, they thought there's a paradox here, because there's more to laugh at, and, and there's more humor here, and and in in the absurdity that exists here, there's a little bit of salvation. We get to breathe a little bit longer before we face our doom. Case in point, uh, guest hosts, Alex, um, in an urn, and the games go on. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot said there. Yeah. People exactly. still bullshit, even though, well, yeah. sorry about that, um, no, even though, no, no, the, yeah, you know, the, right. it, Actually, death is right around the... One of the things I, lo I like that particular one, because it was written at the time that Alex Trebek of Jeopardy passed away, and there was a new host, and, and things just went on, mm -hmm. and... And yeah, and Jeopardy goes on as he is in his urn, and uh, yeah, and yet that's sad in, in one respect, and, and it reminds us of our mortality, but at the same time, it, it makes us chuckle, or it makes us smile. And I, and I think you could probably say that about most of what I deal in the prose poetry or 
And, and in fact, you quote Edward uh, Gorey, uh, take, my, take my work seriously would be high folly. Exactly. Yeah. But, but they make a whole world, which is what, yeah. what you said before. It's yeah. like the, the, the Blake. See a world in a grain of sand, heaven in a wild flower, right. eternity in the palm of your hand, infinity in an hour. But you do the, your whole world there. We, we talk about Mike's stuff a lot and, and, and what makes it work and what, what it has in it and, and uh, how it, makes, it achieves its effect. Uh, in that in that short amount of space, it's it's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. A, a, a lot of times, readers just it just passes them by. But they move to the next one. But which they is nice. move to the next one, next one, and somewhere along the lane. But but I would defend what I do by saying there is something there in every single piece that I write, and it may be more multi-dimensional than, than, than not, not that you're capable of experiencing, but you're not seeing it, you're not there. I can explain every single thousand or two thousand pieces I've done and tell you what the meaning is, is there. God help you if you ask me to do that, but it's there. It's the next you interview. Know, I, I just, uh, that's the way I work. I don't leave anything that's just so totally explicable that why bother with it? It doesn't right. need to be done. But if it has the proverbial ping to it, you know, if, 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 it, if, it, if it achieves storytelling and if it achieves, maybe if I'm lucky, the state of art, that's what I go for. That's what I want to see there. Maybe it's hard for a, a lot of people to see that happening. And maybe they're just not that tuned in. No, you can read it on several levels. You, right. yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think that's what distinguishes it from the, a, a joke with a punchline, yeah. right. is that it can be multi-level. Yeah. yeah, there's nothing in there that's a joke with a punchline. Right. 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 I mean, a ping is not a punchline. In fact, there are times when I have to stop myself because then I realize I've written a joke with a punchline and then I delete it and won't put it in there. If it's if it's that obvious. Or no, I wasn't trying to imply that it no, was. No, that no, that no, way. no. But it's it's yeah. a way of thinking. It's, yeah, it's distinguishing it from from that. Yeah. 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 And, and, go ahead. In a lot of respects, too, uh, people aren't that familiar with what I do. You know the type of thing I do. Uh, it's not flash, it's micro or prose poetry, but I don't think there are a lot of dedicated prose poetry or micro readers out there. So, uh, Isn't micro like a subcategory of flash? I don't call it a subcategory, it's shorter. Yeah, it's yeah. shorter. Right. Yeah. More succinct. Okay. You know, it's succinct art. Do, do you ever write in a short form, Greg? Never. No. Uh, I, uh, I it. It, it's a struggle for me to get down to 5,000 words. Uh -huh. I, my, my process is I write uh, probably something, if it's going to be a 5,000 word short story, that's about 30,000 words to begin with. Then I look for the heart of the story in those 30,000 words, in those, yeah, in those 30 pages or so. Um, and uh, did I say 30,000 words? No, so more like 15 or 20,000 words for a short story that's going to be shorter. And then, um, I find the heart, and then I edit, 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 you know, and, and reduce, reduce, reduce. Uh, so it's like the opposite direction, really, that that uh, that uh, Mike takes. Uh, t tell us about your new novel, Kika Kong. Well, um, you're still at work on that. I'm right? still well. There's a, there's there are some issues with uh, publication uh, yes. issues regarding that, but the novel itself, uh, I'm sort of proud of. Um, it's uh, it's about monsters in a way. It's about the creativity and how what uh, writers or artistic people often do is uh, create monsters. Uh, the, the one of the protagonists is a director, a movie, di a film director, and uh, he's made monster movies. He's made uh, horror movies, but. The, the big deal is he's made he's made he's finally made one big movie uh, uh, that's a family blockbuster adventure horror and it's a tremendous success. So he goes on with his career with that, but he runs into some problems later on when he decides to direct independent films, and one of them is based on a character out of Dostoevsky, uh, Svidrigailov mm -hmm. from Crime and Punishment, and there are some moral issues he gets into when he tries to, to direct the little girl, and I'm going to say some bad words, but while in the process of directing, he tells her, because what happens with this little girl is this character Svidrigailov, Svidrigailov 
dreams. He sees a poor little urchin girl on the street, and he's been kind of a pervert his whole life. Uh, he brings the girl in, he feeds her, he puts her into bed, he's trying to take care of her. Uh, and uh, he leaves the room, returns, and sees that she's become a, made up like a prostitute, a little girl made up as a prostitute. So for some reason, this director character of mine says, this is a beautiful subject for a film, finds the little girl, and in the process of directing her, she, he says, no, you have to think fucky fucky as she looks like a prostitute. And uh, there are lawsuits involved, et cetera, et cetera. His career goes to shit. She, gum, she, becomes, um, she becomes a typical Hollywood slut down the road, and her redemption is what the rest of the novel is about, uh, whether it actually comes or not. Um, so it's a, a, there's a lot of ice breaking in that, inside of, in, in this particular novel. They go for the Kafka stuff. Um, it's actually comprised of, uh, initially comprised of a number of short stories um, because that's another part of my writing process. Uh, if I like a character, I'll write another story about the character to see what happens. Well, what happened there? And then I might say, well, what happened to that character before? And then if, it, if somebody else appeared in the story, well, what's their story? And then before I know it, I've got the parts of a novel, and you work a novel together. So I have another novel I'm marketing, and then this one right now. Both of you are very um, prolific. Uh, you, have, uh, you must be working on something else. Uh, uh, I have a book coming out in March from Pelicanesis. Called Bodies in Recline. I have another manuscript at uh, Mad Hat Press uh, and uh, have begun doing some pieces for something that may or may not appear as mm -hmm. an anthology. Well, I want to give you some time. To, we have like, uh, what do we have? Like, uh, we've got 12 uh, minutes. We've got 12 minutes. So I'd um, like to, both of you to read, you know. Uh, from your choice of work, you want to start? Why don't Greg? I start because yeah, you your off. pieces are short. So, or do you think well, we no, could just no, I, we can sorry. trail off? Why don't you start, Greg? Go ahead. Yeah, want me to start? And, and take the twelve. Yeah. 12 well, minutes. I'll take I'll take some. I do I do want to talk about uh, a couple of the stories in here. Uh, uh, one of them uh, is called Homunculi in Need of Repair, and it's uh, it's a about a couple in, who both work in a, in a doll hospital. And I do want to give Denise Provost a shout out because uh, last time, last Bard's meeting I went to before the plague hit, um, she and I were talking about something and she mentioned that her daughter owns or, or works in, or I think owns a doll hospital in, in Scotland. So the, the, no, the story know. actually popped out of... Uh, what board meeting was this? Uh, it was a Bard's meeting. Well, Bard's, Bard's meeting. meeting. Bard's yeah. meeting, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and uh, so that, of course, went into my notebook, and eventually I got a story out of that. Does she know that? She does not know uh, that. I'll tell her she that. She does not know that, uh, and I should send her a book, because she is my friend on Facebook. But uh, yeah, so that I just actually, I just read from that story, because that story also appears in uh, the MacGuffin, and just last weekend I read from that story, that particular story. Um, the story I'm going to read from now, I'll just read the beginning of, is, uh, is interesting to me because once we talked and you said, how did I decide on the form of a story? And I said, the form emerges organically from the subject of the story. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So I'll rewrite a whole story, maybe in regard to tense or, what the, or person. The um, story I'm going to read from is called... Um, uh, it's got a great title. Let's see. Let me find it first, is Bed of Nails. And it's about an, an aging, uh, very aging rock and roll guy who at the, uh, as he tries to get ready for his last concert, when he finds out it's canceled because the uh, site is, is, is closed because of Legionnaire's disease, he has a stroke. This is also true, by the way. This really happened to Dickie Betts of the Allman Brothers. Uh, and I, obviously missed that concert and didn't go to Hampton Beach because it was loaded with Legionnaire's disease. But some of the choices I made in that story were to tell it from the second person. Um, there were lots of different reasons for that we could talk about sometime. But, and then also that I divided it into sections that are essentially the titles of uh, 
uh, record albums and songs on a record album because he's an aging rock musician. So I'll find that story in this collection. Who's the musician this is based on again? Dickie Betts of the Allman Brothers. Oh, okay. The, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the guitar player who wasn't Dwayne Allman. <laughs> um, title of the story again is Bed of Nails, which is one of the songs in it. And I'll read a bit from that. Bed of Nails. Where I Woke Up Blues. You're not sure about much at first, like why you don't wipe away the snot you taste on your upper lip, or why the man with the ponytail, what's his name, Dwayne, your son, is rolling you so fast in a wheelchair through what seems like a mall that your ball spot feels the breeze. You remember raging at something. If this is a rage hangover, it's the worst ever. And you're in a hospital. You get that now. You try to wink at everyone you pass, but their expressions tell you your eyes haven't obeyed. You'd wipe your face if your arm, if your arm wasn't so heavy and if you weren't worried about waking up the carnal carpal tunnel pain. You stop at a desk and look at your lap while Duane fumbles an explanation to someone. We got to the casino and they told us we wouldn't be playing tonight, that the concert was canceled, and he went into one of his tirades. We thought he was drunk, couldn't figure out where he got the liquor. We watched him pretty close. They didn't think to tell us about the quarantine until we got here. You growl and shift around in the chair. Don't they know your head is cold? He's Denny Jed, Dwayne says, on tour with our band. He used to be with the Sutters back in the day, pretty famous, seminal, some say. When I didn't smell the booze on him, I thought stroke, and we rushed him over here. Seems like the whole town is shut down because of the Legionnaires. He couldn't have that, could he? How could he catch it so fast? Legionnaires? Didn't they march through hot deserts with wiggling horizons? Things were wiggling pretty bad a few minutes ago, but they're finally settling down. You see that Duane is talking to a man with neat white hair. The man bends down, smiling, and wipes your face with a tissue that snags on your bristly chin, then shines a pen-sized flashlight into your eyes, one at a time, pinching his lips now as if he's searching for something he lost. Denny, he says. Should I know him? Denny Jed, I had tickets for your show tonight, and then this quarantine, right? I'm surprised you came to town. They didn't tell us till we showed up, Dwayne says, not about the cancellation or the quarantine. Pops kind of lost it. Breach goddamn contract, you sputter, surprising yourself as much as Dwayne and the doctor, who gape at you like you're a talking mule. What were the symptoms? The man, obviously a doctor, asks Dwayne. He started to rant, then stopped, dazed, like he was punched by a ghost. I grabbed him before he hit the floor. When I asked him what was wrong, he seemed confused, then shut down completely. The doctor sticks his face close to yours again. He smells like peaches, his hair or his breath. He takes your wrist like he's fingering frets on the neck of a guitar. Can you smile, he asks. After I cut some fool's heart out. It feels good to talk. You sit up straighter in the wheelchair. The fact that you're not going to play tonight sinks in, though you're a little ashamed of your relief. The doctor stands back. Denny, looks to me like you experienced the TIA, a transient ischemic attack, a pre-stroke. We'll run some tests, get you an MRI, but you're going to be OK. He turns to Duane. I can't believe I'm seeing him here in person, he says. This is even better than a concert. A little more? What's that? Should I do a little more? Or? Uh, well, let's give, uh, Why don't we give Mike a shot? Yeah, yeah, we'll get Mike. I'm enjoying myself uh, yeah. listening to you. So. All, right, All right, well, so the next section is titled Andrea Departed, which is another song. Your hat's on your head again, but when you lay back on the hospital bed, it flips off like a tiddlywink. The gown you're laced into exposes too much old man flesh. You pull the sheets up to hide your legs. Usually, you undress in the dark to avoid looking at your lower half. Mornings are the worst when the tattoos of wings on your shins remind you of dead birds frozen in dirty snow. You gag when the doctor swabs your throat with a long Q-tip. For a culture so we can rule out legionnaires, he says. Your age makes you susceptible, and you don't smoke? Not for 20 years, you say. Not sure if the pride in your voice comes from having quit or having smoked. Sarah, your fifth and present white wife, put a stop to that pleasure. You going to check my DNA with my spit, you ask? My daddy swore we had royal Indian blood. My second wife, Shoshone, two before Dwayne's mom. You know my song, Sweet Shoshone? 
Shoshone actually had tribal papers. You squint at Duane, who stands next to the doctor. She had nothing to do with you, though. Whatever you got, you got through your grandpa. I don't, dis I don't disbelieve it, Pops. Duane's mother was Andrea, your fourth wife, who died when Duane was three. All those wives and just one child. Sarah raised your boy like he was your own while you spent your life on the road. Looking at the doe eyes Duane got from his mom, you hear riffs from the instrumental you dedicated to her memory. Andrea departed. You only tried it once on this tour. When you passed the solo to Duane, he played a perfect imitation of you. It was either a tribute or a lack of imagination. He never really knew his mother. And I'll stop there. Well, how about you, Mike? Give us a few. We've got a, few, a uh, couple of minutes. Couple of minutes. Uh, there's a couple of pieces I'll read. Short, uh, of course, short. That's what I do. Uh, from Quiet Geography, Trevena Barba Press. <clears throat> this is called His Late Friend. He'd just been phoned by a friend and told a friend had died when he noticed a text from the friend who he was just told had died. He wondered if he had seen the message first and then ignored the call, if he'd still be waiting at Starbucks for his friend who he'd just been told had died. Got another minute or so here? Yeah. <clears throat> All right, this is called One Minute, yeah. Making a Meal for Melissa Was Uncomplicated. She was very fond of chickpea soup. In fact, it was her favorite food. This was well known among her family and friends who would serve her chickpea soup whenever she came to their house for lunch or supper. Thank you very much for serving me chickpea soup, she would say with genuine gratitude. As you know, it is my favorite food. I don't think I've ever had chickpea soup. It's Chickpeas. Good. <clears throat> this is gone. Uh, oh, you got, yeah, you got, what do you got? You got 45 seconds. Okay. 45. <clears throat> Going where the muse takes you. I write a paragraph, but it isn't right. It fails to convey what I intended. After studying it, I decide to scrap it and start again. This time, it's nowhere near what I originally wanted, but I like it better. Thank you, gentlemen, for being on uh, Poet to Poet, Writer to Writer. Um, and uh, we hope uh, you're going to be doing any readings uh, coming up? Or? Uh, no. Uh, no. Well, and again, thank you for uh, being on Poet to Poet, Writer to Writer, and uh, we'll see you next month. <laughs>